Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Startup Sense podcast. This is your host, Jonah Lupton. Another great episode for you today. Uh, tonight, we're actually going to be talking to Denise Thomas. She is the co-founder of a company called Apple Pie Capital. I'm actually curious to know how they came up with that name, but we'll ask her in a few minutes. The company is based in San Francisco, 42 employees spread around the country. Uh, most of their employees that are not in San Francisco are doing biz dev, but uh, 42 employees. They've raised about $26 million. Uh, we'll talk about the fundraising process. Uh, Apple Pie Capital essentially provides uh, alternative financing for franchise businesses. So they work with the franchisors and the franchisees to make that happen. Uh, I've made a couple introductions to them with the franchisors that I know. Uh, the website is applepiecapital.com. Uh, business was started just a few years ago in 2014. And let's talk to Denise. Denise, how are you? I'm very good, Jonah. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Uh, let's start off with the uh, the first question here. Why did you call the company Apple Pie Capital? Where did that come from? Well, as you probably know, it's very difficult to find URLs these days that are available. Yeah. Um, but when we were searching for the name, we um, I invited a lot of my marketing folks over for dinner and drinks and said, you can't leave until we come up with a name. It happened to be during the holidays, and they were still not uh, very um, clear on an option for us by dessert. So when dessert came around, I brought out my apple pie, and they all looked at me rather funny and said, this is the name. <laughs> and, and I realized in that moment, coming from a brand background, that they had actually hit on something very special um, cool. because apple pie – is uh, Main Street America and franchise businesses uh, are the same. And so it made a lot of sense to me. Perfect. Yeah, that's a good connection. Um, so talk to us. What exactly does your business do? So we fund franchise businesses all over the country. Um, we're a 50-state uh, online lender that provides financing for um, franchise ease. And these are the individual locations um, that open up across the country uh, for a given brand. So if you, um, if you think about a brand, you know, um, you know, they may be in your backyard, they might be in 25 states, they might be in all 50 states. Um, and they come to us and, and seek financing. Uh, you'll typically see people looking for anywhere from, you know, 200,000 to $2 million, but it can be higher than that. And we will work with them to make a plan and, and look at what their growth plans are because many franchisees own more than one unit. So it's oftentimes a function of are they looking to refinance something? Are they looking to grow? Are they looking to remodel? Because that's a requirement every seven to ten years by the brand and we'll help them with all of those needs. Do you work across all the different industries or are there specific industries that you really yes. focus on? Um, there's only two industries that we don't currently do. One is automotive. It's a very small percentage of the overall market. And the other is uh, hotels, so real estate-based uh, transactions where the real estate is owned uh, as well as the business. We work with leased spaces as opposed to real estate. Gotcha. And how do you typically find your clients? I mean, I assume you have these biz dev people around the country that are calling on the franchisors and the brands. Well, it's a little better than that. Um, we know most of the brands that we want to work with. Um, we have uh, business development folks that have been in the industry for 25 years. We have also established ourselves in the industry itself. So we never cold call a brand. We always have a relationship when we open that door. And what were you doing before you started this company? Is that where some of these relationships came from? Uh, I was having a life. <laughs> no, and now you don't have one <laughs> uh no i was um in another financial fintech business that provided um secondary market uh trading for pre-ipo stocks so if you were in facebook or twitter or linkedin before they went public and you were an entrepreneur that needed some liquidity you might have come to my company um uh, that I was previously with and asked to sell some of your stock. We did 40 auctions in Facebook um, and, and 
that when it went public, of course, then we had no more pre IPO trading to do, but we, we did that for, um, you know, hundreds of companies. And, uh, when I was there, I was called upon, um, by a fund that was supplying capital for lending to consumers. Um, and this was a fund that was providing capital to lending club and prosper at the time. Okay. Yep. Uh, so this is over five years ago. And I, I thought that's very interesting. And I started looking into the business version of those businesses. Okay. Um, now with regards to qualifying franchisees, you know, I, one reason that a franchisee, I guess, becomes a franchisee is that they believe in the brand and, and they get, you know, they have a whole business plan. They're essentially buying into the business strategy of the franchise board. So I assume you put a lot of weight on what that business strategy is, right? Yes, we do. The unit economics, you know, what a brand does well is they select operators who can operate their units. They provide, you know, training and support. Uh, they plan for and determine the geographic locations across the country so that um, there is the proper unit economics and that the franchisee can make money. So it's very important that the brand be doing a good job of those things because there are really three reasons that a franchise business can fail. And that's not the right operator in the unit, not the right location, uh, or the unit economics uh, are poor and they don't get the proper support from the franchise brand. And you typically don't work with startup franchisees or franchisors. So there's some sort of a track record already, right? With the franchisor, yes, but we do work with new franchisees within those business uh, sectors. So in, or, in order for a franchisee, and let's you know take the food industry, since that's probably one of the more popular industries that you work with, what type of um, you know credentials or financial credit worthiness or personal capital do they have to pledge them to to do uh, to do a loan or to to get financing from Apple Pie? So typically, we're going to look at their um, their financial, uh, personal financials. If they have existing businesses, we'll look at their existing business financials. We do do projection-based financing, which is very unusual and unique, uh, meaning a new unit, a uh, person who's never run one before uh, in a certain brand could come to us and say, I want to borrow you know, $500,000. Uh, we'll look at their net worth. Uh, we'll look at their liquid net worth, uh, their FICO score. Um, our average FICO score is 750, and the median net worth of our borrowers is $2 million. So these are pretty experienced oh, wow. folks. Yeah, yeah for sure. And, and, you know, that doesn't mean every borrower has that type of, of net worth, um, but they have to have enough net worth that they can weather the storm if if starting up their business takes a little longer than they expected uh, but we also make sure we size the loan properly so that they can uh, get to the break even uh, that they expect to. What's the process if they default on their loan? Um, well, that's uh, that's something that we work with. If if a borrower is, let's say, having difficulty with their payment, there are a lot of different things you can do in franchise that you can't do in any normal small business. For example. Um, they can come to us, first of all, and say they need, you know, three more months of interest only, as an example. And we might do a loan modification for them. Uh, there aren't very many of those. They happen from time to time. Sometimes there's a health issue or some setback. Um, we also have situations where the franchisor adds more help to that franchisee in the form of marketing or actually training or um, holidays on their royalty fees so that they give them some relief. Gotcha. There can be rent holiday. There are all kinds of levers and there's all kinds of leverage. So it's important to note that a franchise business that has a struggle has a support system. So you told me in the pre-call that you actually started this business out of your living room, which is probably pretty common for most startups. So take us back of a, a few years. How did the, how did this whole thing get off the ground? Well, once I had the idea that no one uh, out in the online lending space was doing anything like this, 
I started to research the franchise industry to determine how large it was, and I found that it was a $30 billion annual uh, capital demand on the debt side and $15 billion a year on equity, wow. and that was a very large market. I began to research individual franchise brands to understand their financing problems with their franchisees and began to build a product and gather an advisory board who could help formulate what this would look like if done differently than a bank. And we learned that speed and, you know, removing complexity, making it simpler, um, making it online, uh, providing more clarity and predictability so that they could sign leases, for example, were all attributes of a better loan product. And we began to form that better loan product and build a platform uh, prototype um, I had uh, several of my colleagues that had worked with me before were very interested in joining me on this venture. And so we worked together, as uh, a lot of people do. They moonlight and help start a new business. And we did that for probably, gosh, close to a year um, before we took any funding in. And I self-financed the business for a while. Um, we had, you know, developers actually being paid. <laughs> and most people were working working for equity, but we did have, uh, you know, very early uh, participants who were just helping build the business on, on the future. So in mid-2014 is when you raised your first round of seed capital. How did you, uh, how did you get those investors on board? Well, I had several uh, people that I know provide um, close to a million dollars as, as, seed seed money, and I'll call that my convertible note. Um, and then I began to look at, at early stage venture capital, and I found my lead investor, Freestyle Capital, uh, here in California, in Marin. And they offered me a term sheet within you know, a very short period of time after listening to the opportunity and seeing what we were doing. And then from there, uh, the other investors followed very quickly. So the seed round was actually quite fast, I would say, when you think about fundraising as it goes. Right. Some some entrepreneurs are out there for months and months trying to raise that seed round. Uh, and they just they get a lot of no's. So obviously there was a lot of a lot of interest on the VC side. Um, so you raised the, the I guess, was it close to four million back in mid 2014? And then when did you raise more capital after that? And did you raise from the same investors? Um, I raised the next round in April of 15, and the same investors were in my next round as well as new investors. Okay, cool. Um, what's been the biggest challenge over the last three years? Capital, not equity capital, not to run the business, but capital to buy the loans. Um, you'll hear that from most lending companies. Your challenge is either not enough loans or not enough capital to fund the loans. And there's always a balance in that. In my business, capital has always been very important because we have much larger loans. Our average loan size is $400,000. Wow, wow. And, and so we're not doing a consumer loan of $15,000. Um, and, you know, we have to have a lot of capital on hand and committed in order to fund our borrowers. Now, we do have a lot of capital today, but, you know, over the past three years, we had no track record. So we had to find data that would help prove that our underwriting model was going to produce, you know, strong performing loans and that our assumptions around our loss rates were correct. So you have to build a history in order to really do that. And we were lucky enough to have investors um go with us and, and take risk early. So what happens to these loans after you make them? So you provide that an average of $400,000 in capital to the franchisees. Do you keep that $400,000 on the books and you service it? Or I know that you also sell some of these off or provide investment opportunity for other types of investors, right? Hedge funds. And, yeah, we, uh, sell, we sell most of the loans um, off and we do retain servicing. So we are servicing our loans, um, but 
what happens is investors get principal and interest that's pretty nice in their bank account. <laughs> right. Certainly better than your typical, uh, you know, CD rates nowadays and savings account rates and, you know, even traditional corporate bonds. I mean, the rates are just so damn low nowadays. What are, like, I, so I, I know that um, there are some franchise opportunities or financing opportunities for some uh, Ben and Jerry's franchises. What would like a, what would an investor like myself receive if I, invested in that franchise or bought that debt, whatever it's considered? Yeah. So we, um, I have a portfolio myself. Uh, I bought every loan on our marketplace. So I have assembled a portfolio and I receive about 8.5% um, in interest. And I receive principal every month from the loans that are paying principal. Some loans have interest only periods and in which case I'd just be seeing the interest but we receive um, monthly principal and interest payments. If we have, if we include losses that are projected, I would say the net after uh, losses uh, and servicing would be about 7.5. Okay. But we have not had losses in that portfolio, so I'm still at 8.5. <laughs> are you able to give us any financials for the company? I mean, not in terms of revenue, but maybe in terms of how many different franchisors, franchisors or franchisees Apple Pie's worked with over the last few years? Sure. We have um, a total of 60 brand partners right now. Okay. And, and all over the country? There are 3,500. Yeah, they're all over the country. But to give you some perspective, there are 3,500 brands in wow. the total universe of, of franchise. But there's 3,500 brands that franchise. That's right. I never would have guessed it was that high for some reason. That just seems like a lot, you know, maybe because I, you know, a lot of them are just in regional areas that I've never been to. So I've probably never seen them before or heard of them. Um, that's, what, absolutely, what are, that's absolutely right. I mean, I remember a couple of years ago seeing some stats on what it cost to open up like a Subway or a Dunkin' Donuts. And it was two to three times more expensive than, than I would have expected. Um, I mean, you said the average is 400,000, some are up to 2 million. What are the more what are the more expensive type of ones? Well, anything that is um, requiring you know a um, significant you know build out from an equipment perspective. I mean, you'll see some you know some gyms, for example, or or um, fitness type franchise businesses will have a, a large upfront cost. We have some salons that have, you know, a large upfront cost, but their payback is so fast because they're subscription businesses or they're pre-sale businesses where they can get the uh, the consumer uh, traffic uh, happening, you know, quickly, even before they open. If Orange Theory was, Fitness is an example so, of that. If someone was to come to you and say, Diane, I want to open up a franchise out of all the deals that you've done and the data that you've collected – what type of franchise do you think I should open? Where is my greatest chance for success? Would you be able to provide them with an answer? Uh, not on a geographic basis. What I would say is, where do you want to be and what do you want to be doing? What type of business do you want to run? And within the brands that we know, we would be able to narrow that if somebody wanted to be in a fitness business or a salon business or a food business, we'd be able to talk about you know, the brands we work with. Um, but that's, that's really the extent of, of where our advice would be able to go today. Okay. And I mean, are most franchisees in larger cities and metropolitan areas where there's a, you know, a greater population density? Depends on the type of system we're talking about. Some franchise systems do better in, in, um, outside of major metro areas some do very well in metro areas and in secondary markets. They're, um, you know, they don't make as much money, but they do well. So it just depends. So talk to us about hiring. Uh, like I said in the intro, most of your people are in San Francisco, but you have some biz dev people around the country. What's been your strategy for bringing the right people onto the team? Well, we hire for attitude <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and in many cases, we train for everything else, but we also, we have people that are out of financial services, 
traditional financial services where they want to be in a more entrepreneurial environment. We have people, um, you know, who've been in more of technology. Um, so it comes from, you know, all different areas. Banks, we've hired people from banks who would okay. like to try doing what they do in a, um, you know, innovative fintech environment. Right, right. I would certainly think a lot, a lot of, of them, Sorry, I was going to also mention that we, we've done a lot of referential hiring, which means that a lot of the people that we've hired, somebody here knew them prior. Um, that's been important to us as well. Yeah, it's always nice when someone at your company can vouch for someone that you're interviewing. Um, most of your biz dev people, I would think, have come out of banking where they have a lot of relationships with small business owners. Is that true? Uh, the majority now really have come out of the franchise lending space, actually. Oh, okay. Okay. So there, so there is, I mean, you, your Apple Pie is not the only company out there doing franchise lending, right? Oh, no. I mean, there are banks that do lending. We work with banks that do lending. We sell our loans to banks because we can originate them more efficiently than they can with the brand relationship. So what was what was the need in the market that wasn't necessarily being solved? Why did you see an opportunity that maybe the, but the banks weren't doing something right. Well, our proprietary product has many features that are designed specifically for this industry. Um, it wasn't very efficient. If you get an SBA loan, it's not efficient. We, we're making SBA loans more efficient as well um, today. When we started, we just had our proprietary product, but we have a full breadth of product now, and we can offer very you know different solutions to different needs. But our proprietary product really solved issues of, I don't want to put my house up for collateral. I need the loan now. <laughs> I need to know that I can commit to this business, build this business because I found the right location and I need to sign a lease. So speed, efficiency, less paperwork, um, more um, personalization and planning to you know help people understand how they can own more than one unit and how to plan their financing accordingly. So financial planning is a dimension of what we do with people. Now, you and your company have dissected, I'm sure, hundreds of different franchises and brands over the past few years. Do you think it's smarter to open up, I mean, whether you're going into fitness or, you know, you're opening up a sandwich shop or a restaurant or any of those businesses, do you think it's smarter to open up a franchise rather than try to do it yourself? and start from scratch on everything? Well, I certainly would start from scratch on, on a small business. I think it's much more risky. I think the failure rates of small business are very high. So I would say it is far better to have a blueprint and to have a company backing you in terms of helping you understand how to be successful and, and make the kind of money that you want to make in a small business. Is there a national failure rate that you know of for franchisees? Well, there is no published failure rate across the whole industry. Okay. We do have proprietary data on all of the brands that we work with, and we know how many uh, units they've opened and closed over their life cycle. Um, we don't share that information publicly, but it is part of our risk model. I'm just sitting here Googling uh, the failure rate for small businesses in the U.S. And the quick stat I got was 66% uh, of small businesses will survive their first two years. Um, I, don't, I don't know the exact stats, but I mean, I've heard like, you know, three out of five or even four out of five businesses won't make it past five years. You know, small business. So That's I would, right. I would think the franchise businesses, like you said, have a much greater chance of survival because there's a roadmap, you know, there's a plan, there's a strategy that's been proven to work, there's a track record, right. all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, and I can say that, you know, there, there, that's absolutely true, and, and we do screen brands on the basis of, of that, so we're working with high-quality systems. What are two or three of the brands that you would love Apple Pie to begin working with? Well, brands that I don't work with today. Yeah, yeah, brands that you don't work with, but you know, you'd love to be able to get in front of them and and offer your services. Well, I know this might sound odd, but there really isn't anybody I can't get in front of. <laughs> <laughs> 
hey, that's that's not a bad thing. I appreciate the honesty. <laughs> I mean, I, I assume you guys are probably talking to hundreds of brands all the time, right? Well, we, we have 60, and we're usually talking in, to anywhere from 10 to 20 brands additional at a time. What What gets things to move to the next step, you know, where you begin – providing finance financing for their franchisees is just something, I mean, like well, you, have to, you have to do dil- due diligence on them. Like they kind of have to agree to all the due diligence. You know, to see if it's a good fit. We, we do, we do diligence. We have fast track diligence depending on the history of the brand and the information we can obtain. Um, sometimes it's just, you know, inertia, um, and time for the brand to communicate to its existing franchisees that there's a lender option for them. Other times it's, it's just, they have a conference where we can attend and they can, and all of their franchisees can learn about us. And that might not be scheduled for six months after we sign with them. So we'll see a certain kind of volume coming through until we're able to integrate more with them uh, over time. What do you think the average age of one of your borrowers is? I don't know, but I would tell you that my guess uh, would be you've got three different uh, decades represented, um, people in their 30s, people in their 40s, and people in their 50s. There are very few people below that and above that. Yeah, that's what I was that's what I was trying to get to. I mean, I'm just trying to, you know, I know a lot of people in their twenties and you know, a lot of them want to open up their own business, but obviously it's finding the capital is very difficult. Uh, they just need their parents to give them a personal guarantee. Have you have you have you seen that before? Has that worked? Well, there can certainly be a, a guarantor who's a part owner in the in the business that definitely their financials would, would serve um as as an element of this transaction, or even if someone was able to raise, say they needed a two hundred fifty thousand dollar loan, would they be able to raise a portion of that from an outside investor and then use that as collateral or like the down payment? I mean, does it work that way? Well, we're going to look at how much debt they have to service. So, if that is an equity investor, certainly. I mean, if there's an equity participant and they don't have to pay them uh, to service that other than out of revenues, we'll certainly look at that. What do you think, I mean, and I know this is such a general question because I'm sure every industry is different and every business that in each industry is different, but how long does it typically take a fran- one of your franchisees to, to, uh, to break even or get to cash flow positive? You know, you'll see some systems cash flow positive within two months. Wow. Uh, you can see others that take a year and a half to two years. That's a long time. Yeah. That's not the norm. What are the types of businesses? Like what, what industry can you get the cash flow positive within just a few months? Some of the salon concepts and the fitness concepts. Okay. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I, okay. Right. Yeah. I mean, gyms, gyms are an interesting one. Uh, If you find the right market, the right location, you know, the right pricing model. I mean, you can get, you know, 500 to a thousand members in just the first couple months probably signed up. Absolutely. <laughs> it's it's one of those few things you can pre-sell to and pre-market in the area. That's very true too, right? Yeah, it's kind of hard to <laughs> pre-sell sandwiches and and the haircut. <laughs> exactly. Um, what else can you tell us? And what what are all some what are some of the uh, some of the other challenges or even mistakes or failures or missteps that you guys made along the way that you wish you could go back and kind of do over? You know, I, I I often think about this question, and I've lived a long time, and I have very few regrets. Um, <laughs> so as I think about, you know, mistakes, you know, I think when I look back, this is an interesting exercise you go through as a company when you're planning and replanning, is you ask yourself the question, what would I do now? knowing what I knew then, not knowing what I know now, (laughs) because it's very hard to separate the past from the, from the present. And I always find that question difficult because at the time we make our decisions based on the available information. 
And when I re-examine them, I all often find that, wow, that's what we knew at that time. If we had known something new, which we learned later, there are many things I would change. <laughs> but at the time, you know, when I look back, uh, there's an awful lot that this business got right. And it's not all, you know, my doing. It's really a function of great advisors and people I've been able to work with to, to help us avoid you know, pitfalls and mistakes. We have great investors who've been in fintech and, and lending and, and this space, and they know they've seen all the movies so they can help us understand how things end uh, or begin or stay uh, thriving. And that's really, really key is to have people that can tell you that. So now on a more positive note, what are some of the things that you're the most proud of over the last few years that you've been able to accomplish, you and your team? Ah, well, that's kind of fun to talk about. I think providing investors return is really exciting to me. And we, we're able to do that in two ways. One is through our product that we offer, which is the loan product. But the other is that we've raised three rounds of funding and we've increased the value of our company in every round. And I'm very proud of that for the shareholders that have believed in us. Um. Anything else that we skipped over that you want a chance to talk about today? Kind of, uh, I, know I rattled off a bunch of questions, but maybe there's something in the back of your head that you just want to share with us. Well, on a personal note, I'm very proud of the three adult children I have. <laughs> Do any of them work for you? There is one in our company, as a matter of fact. And uh, I, their... I popular demand, by the way. Really? <laughs> That's always a tricky one, right? Hiring a, a child to work at the business. I mean, did you have some, some reservations about that? Oh, very much. I actually asked my board, uh, you know, what they thought of that. Um, my team was was the pressure point on that. They all wanted me to do this. And we had to do independent salary study. We had to, I had to recuse myself from ever being involved in anything related to the compensation um, and the team still wanted to do this in spite of those hurdles. And, and we also, um, obviously, you know, someone can never report to me who, who comes into, uh, a role as a family member, but we've, we've put up all the, the right borders and, and the team, you know, works really well together and they're the ones who pressured me. <laughs> yeah. So that was the guys definitely handle it the right way. Um, now did yeah. you hire, did you hire your child or did they get the job, um, after they went to go work somewhere else or did they get the job right, right out of college? They actually came from Google. Oh, perfect. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so they're credible. Um, how long were they at Google for? Um, two years. Okay. Perfect. In New York. Last question, I guess. What is the single best piece of advice that you've gotten from any of your investors thus far? It was the very first uh, investor that uh, told me, when you start a business, you will have five problems to solve. If you can get it down to one in the first 12 months, you will succeed. Do you think that was accurate advice? Very. Do you, what were those problems? Are you able to share them or is that top secret? Well, what they're really saying is any business that, that starts will have five key issues, you know, or fewer to, to resolve. You don't want to have so many that, that it's insurmountable. Um, but in my business, the obvious ones are where are you going to get the, the borrowers and where are you going to get the money? <laughs> those are, those are the starting uh, problems to solve. Um, we had regulatory infrastructure we had to build. We had to make sure we did that right. Um, we had, um, I would say, you know, obviously finding the, you know, as I said, finding the capital uh, was very, very important. And as you eliminate those problems, you eliminate the risks in the business. Okay. Well, let's end it there. I know I've had you on the phone now for about 40 minutes, 35, 40 minutes. Um, is, this, is this the end of your workday? 
Ha ha ha! That's very funny. You know, startups don't work at five o'clock. <laughs> what does your uh, What does your typical work day? I mean, do you what time do you typically head home, or do you have a lot of meetings at at night? I I do a fair amount at night. Most of that is actually on my own. I I have some meetings with my team in the evenings and on the weekends still, um, but that has lessened over time as we've grown and had more infrastructure and more people. Um, but my work day probably begins at, you know, New York time. So I'm usually at 6 a.m. and I usually go probably anywhere from, you know, eight or nine o'clock at night um, wow. with some small break in between. That's not, is that healthy? Do you not, do you not burn out as a <laughs> entrepreneur? Well, I'm on my third year, Jonah, and I don't feel burnt out. I feel inspired. Perfect. You lo- Obviously, you love what you do. I do love it. And the people around me, we've, we've got a great team here, and, and that is very energizing, knowing that this team is, is producing the great things that, that we're doing. And it's just very rewarding to, to see that and to work with our partners, our banks, and our investors, and and our franchisees, it's it's also very rewarding to hear uh, the everyday entrepreneur's story that wants to be in a franchise business. They're very inspiring people. Totally agree. Well, thank you so much. Let's end on that high note. Um, loved everything you had to say. Thank you so much for you know being a guest on the Startup Sense podcast. Appreciate all your answers and your honesty and, and everything you do as an entrepreneur. So uh, from all of us, thank you very much. And what's the best way that obviously we can go to the website, applepiecapital.com. Um, are there any social media accounts that we can follow you at? Yes, we have a Twitter account and Facebook okay. account. Okay, perfect. What about yourself? Do you do any, you. any tweeting? <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a sore subject with me because my one of my investors would love me to uh, tweet more often. And it is something that I... I aspire to do. And as soon as we get to a certain growth state, I think I will become a thought leader uh, and, and tweet more often. <laughs> Perfect. Hey, it's good advice. Um, not everyone should be tweeting, not unless you have something intelligent to say. So, and I'm sure you have plenty to say, but so start tweeting. No I've, been to Twitter. Twitter. I've been on Twitter for almost two years now, so I love it. But I use it a lot less now than I used to. I will say that. Uh, Well, thank you so much, Denise. Appreciate you being guest, and let's stay in touch for sure. Thank you, Jonah. I keep, oh, sorry, I keep calling you Denise. It's Diane. Oh, God, you should have corrected me. No, no, it is Denise. (laughs) Oh, wait, it is Denise. You did it right. Oh, it is Denise. Yes. Oh, okay. Did I call you Diane once? Yes. (laughs) It's okay. (laughs) It's been a long day for me, too. So, okay. No worries. Thanks, Denise. I appreciate your time today. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.